what I'm going to talk about is uh, examinations. And, uh, you know, as, as I get older, I always um, run out of time. So I'm going to tell you the, the last line first. <laughs> so, so that, you know, uh, what I'm going to, at the end of 15 minutes, come to is that uh, children should be allowed to use their smartphones during the GCSE and the A-level examinations. Just a simple decision. Now I'll tell you why. So you know exams and education, everything, it's about knowing stuff. You've got to know things. That's why you send people to schools and everything. For uh, almost the first 17 years of their lives, we try to teach them everything we know. Why? So that, just in case, <laughs> you know, remember every, everybody in this room, I think, has been taught, or most people, have been taught how to solve a quadratic equation. <laughs> you know, and you, you, you answered that in your GCSE and everything. And why was it taught? Because what if, at the end of this session, you were to walk out <laughs> into Durham and an ugly looking quadratic equation <laughs> was, was standing in front of you, <laughs> right? So just in case, just in case, just in case. That's how people used to survive, you know? Just in case education, uh, famous people like, for example, Robinson Crusoe. He needed just-in-time education. Um, but uh, your children are unlikely to be stuck on a deserted island or to be lost in the high seas on a ship. Um, or even if they were, uh, they wouldn't need a theodolite and trigonometry to figure out where they are. They would need a smartphone. So what does all that mean? Well, just to jump back to... Uh, where I began from was a long time ago, 1999. You know, it just keeps getting longer and longer that time. So it's 21 or 22 years, I don't know. Um, it was a very simple experiment. It was an experiment in 1999 to expose children to the internet on streets. You know, you walk down the street and you see a, a thing, a screen on the wall, and it has the internet on it and it's three feet off the ground, just imagine. So what would happen? Well, what happened then, this was in India, what happened then is what would happen now. Children are the first people who would go there. They'll start, you know, figuring out stuff. What would they do? Well, according to grown-ups, they would waste time. <laughs> but according to them, I don't think they think they're wasting time. They, they just learn something new all the time. That's what I saw in 1999 with street children, very poor street children in New Delhi, when given access to the internet in public spaces, would group together and would learn in a very disorganized way. Except that every day, they would know a little bit more than what they did the previous day. And I thought, well, that's about what happens in school as well. So, uh, the experiment was called the hole in the wall. I brought those ideas here to Gateshead in 2006. And uh, all over, the, you know, I feel sentimental about it. This was the place where I went into the schools in County Durham and built inside classrooms something similar to the hole in the wall. It was very simple. Take a class full of children, give them a few computers, just a few with big screens, and ask them a question. You know, ask them a question like, why do we sneeze? And then the children would say, oh, well, you know, something in my nose. I, I, I don't know, I don't know. You just figure it out. 
this was in 2006, and the children would say, we're not allowed to use the internet. And I said, well, that's all right, for this, this class you are. And then magic would start to happen. They would talk to me about sinuses, about bacteria, about irritation, about all sorts of things. Eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds of Gateshead and Durham. We gave this whole thing a name. We called it a self-organized learning environment, which is simply sparked by a good, big, interesting question. Not necessarily a complicated question, just a good, big, interesting question. Um, what's an example? Let me see. A few of the children in Gates had created this question. Do fish cry? Well, that's a good question, you know. I bet you don't know the answer. <laughs> so, all right. So self-organized learning environments, I'm happy to say, started from here, northeast England, spread throughout the world. Within five years, it was in every continent. And teachers said, this is very cool. If you haven't prepared for your lesson, just... <laughs> Just do a Sugata. <laughs> okay, I heard this all the way from Australia to Argentina to the United States. I said, go ahead, do that. And then, uh, you know, I got a bit of money, I got a prize. I developed the idea further and it became what's called a school in the cloud. Where the curriculum consists of only questions. Not just simple old questions that you can Google and find out in two seconds, but questions to which no one knows the answer. So if no one knows the answer, the internet doesn't know either. What you get is self-organized learning. It caught on. And somebody gave it a name. Remember I, I described the old method as just in case somebody changed that in Hong Kong, China, to just in time. Okay. This is uh, one of my sessions in a school in Hong Kong. I think the notice on top of the computer <laughs> says it all. But, uh, that school never called me back, though. <laughs> <laughs> And then the world changed, as we all know, to anytime, anywhere, little gadgets. Why was it just in case? Because you, know, you can't carry your teachers with you, you can't carry your books with you, you can't carry a library with you. You've got to all pack it up into your head by the time you're 17 and before you can launch out on that ship or whatever. So, that all changed because of this little device, because you could have your teachers with you, and you could have your libraries with you, you could have everything with you in your pocket all the time. Why stuff it inside? Just in time. All you need to know is to be able to pick it out, to find out where it is, understand it quickly, and tell your friends. But how do we test, how do we examine if the system is working? Well, unfortunately, that's how we do it. You're alone, there's no assistive device anywhere. You're not allowed to talk to anybody. I'll ask you questions. You have to answer it from your head. If you can't, you fail. And if you are a failure, hang around in a pub or something, I don't care. You know? <laughs> so that sort of thing. Uh, what does it mean? What, what, what is this fail? How do we know if somebody knows something? Well, we know it now like this. This is how we test for knowing. You say, well, you know, uh, is, it, uh, is it safe for me, uh, you know, uh, to, to uh, go to a crowded bus stop right now? And then you, you check if this young man that you asked or this young woman that you asked and, uh, and, and the smartphone and you make up your mind, does he know or he doesn't? Test for knowing is different 
from test for knowledge. We made that shift. It's already happened. We just don't realize that we've made that shift. So here's what we need. Three things, that's all. Computing, you've got to know how to use that little gadget. And, you know, if you are below the age of 12, then you probably are really good at it anyway. If you are over the age of about 18 or so, you've got a problem. You know, <laughs> read a book or something. You know, smartphones for dummies or something like that. <laughs> but you've got to be able to use the gadget. You've got to be able to look up stuff. You've got to be able to comprehend what you're looking at. Figure out, if it, is it true, is it false, is it fake news, is it bad, is it good? How do you do that? You need your friends. Don't do it alone. It's very dangerous alone because, you know, they'll just, they'll just brainwash you into believing something. But if you're in a group, no way. Particularly if it's a group of children, and I overhear them all the time. They're very clear. That, they say, is rubbish. <laughs> And then they go on to something else. So you've got to comprehend. Once you've comprehended what you were looking for, you've got to be able to tell the answer to somebody. Okay? To your friends, to your teachers, to your parents. So three things. Computing, comprehension, and communication. If you're good at those three things, you don't really need much else. I don't need to test you for anything more than these three things. Computing, comprehension, communication. And if you can't do those things, and if all you can do is to solve quadratic equations from your memory, you've got a problem. How do I prove that? Because, you know, nobody agrees. <laughs> well, look at the highest degree we have in the education system, the PhD. Does it have an exam? No. What do they do? They give you a question to which no one knows the answer. <laughs> they give you three years, four years, five years. Go and find out. You have somebody called a supervisor, who's usually not there because he's somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to find your own methods. You've got to write up a thesis. And how do they examine it? They sit across the table, a few experts, and they ask you some questions. Do they ask you to solve quadratic equations? No. They ask you <laughs> simpler questions. They ask you things like, have you heard of quadratic equations? And you say, yes, sir. And they say, that's all right then. OK, let's go on to the next thing. <laughs> Why? Because they know that if you heard of quadratic equations, you would know how to solve them if you ever needed to solve one. That's how the PhD works. At the pinnacle of our system is a self-organized learning environment. Why isn't it there in the rest of the system? So I started working on this question. What would happen if we give internet access during an exam? And everybody said, cheating. Cheating? So I said, oh. Looking up Google is cheating. That means everybody is cheating all the time. <laughs> everybody is cheating. I mean, when I go out of this place, I'll have to find my way to the bus station. I'm going to use Google. I will cheat. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known this. You know, my geography teacher should have taught me this. <laughs> it should have come in the A level. <laughs> well, so what would happen? Everybody said it's cheating, this is not going to work. I've been at it for, for four years now, trying to say this from continent to continent to continent. Give them the internet back during the exam, during the test. Nobody listened, nobody at all. Except for one last year. From out of the blue came an email from Israel. They said, our government would like to try this. I designed an experiment, they just conducted that experiment. The results are in. The trouble is that it's under publication, so I can't really tell you what the results are, except in very broad terms. What happens if you give the internet during an examination in very, very broad terms? 
the Israeli result over 600 students is it's no big deal. Doesn't change the marks by more than 5%. So what will happen if we allow the use of the internet during examinations? Well, just think, if you're a teacher and you know that your student is going to use the internet during an exam, you can say, well, well learn to search, you know? Don't just keep memorizing stuff, come on. <laughs> okay. Your teaching style will change. Your curriculum will change, what you put inside, because you won't put stuff which is always already easy to find on the internet, you'll put the stuff that people don't know. A curriculum of the things that we don't know yet. And finally, at home, the parents were saying, you, you know, what are you doing with that phone all the time? You should be reading Great Expectations. <laughs> well, you stop doing that. You'll say, you know, learn how to search properly, okay? You've got your GCSE coming up. <laughs> One administrative decision is all that will take to change the whole system. One decision, just a piece of paper and a signature. Allow the use of the internet during exam. Will it happen? Well, it has to. It has to happen, you know, because today you can figure out that somebody is using the internet because they pull out their phones or whatever, and you, you know, put the police after them and catch them, put them into jail or whatever. But those devices are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They'll go into your ears, they'll go into your eyes. What are you going to do? You're going to take your child and put them through an MRI scanner before they go into... <laughs> the internet will come into the exam, and when it does, it will create a world which is already there and which people of my generation do not like. This is the world it will create. Thanks, then. Great to see you again, and thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for, for this, uh, this totally uh, different presentation from what we've heard before. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, I, I, it's great because it's, it's such a simple idea. It seems not only inevitable, but just that it doesn't reflect in any way reality. Of course, as obviously as you mentioned jokingly about the bus station and whatnot, we're all using, and we would want you know, people working with us or for us or, or above us for that matter that know how to use the internet in, in an effective way, right? And um, it's, it's, it's actually, I mean, uh, my, my mother is, is elderly and so, you know, having to try and navigate her through some of the most basic internet things, it's, it's really frustrating, you know, because um, once she does get it, but not to criticize my mother here on stage, but uh, my, my other question is that inevitably, so let's assume at some point, hopefully in the near future, your rule is accepted, and you know the the the, uh, the sort of the technology ban is lifted from the from the from the assessment. I guess inevitably it then means that you know I, I would have thought inevitably that that eventually you know as more and more people kind of get used to this new rule and they realize that uh, the the scores will actually start to bunch start to raise and bunch up, right? So I, I guess my question is is like. Doesn't the also the actually what we test then need to change, or shouldn't it change in addition to this this idea about the internet being in the in, in the testing room? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I uh, thanks for asking. I, I forgot to mention when I said what are the, what will be the effects of uh, such a decision to allow the internet. The first is the kind of question that an examiner sets for the question paper will have to change. You can't put a question where you Google and in two seconds you get the answer because it's pointless. Everybody will get it right. Yeah. So, you, so the, the kind of questions will change. And that in turn will spark off what teachers teach. That will change. Yeah. What administrators, how administrators plan, that will change. Right. The whole system will shake. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, and so let's, let's cast our minds forward into 10 years or whatever the period of time for all this to happen. Uh, how would you expect the assessment, the kind of questions in this assessment, what, what might they be like as opposed to what they are today? I would say you would test for a student's ability 
to express themselves yeah. and to synthesize ideas. Okay. If you ask them questions to which people don't have the answer, yeah. you know, for example, it was recently found out that there's a lot of water on the moon. So there's no point in asking a question, say, is there a lot of water on the moon? Because it will, you know, Google will tell you in two seconds. But you could say, I believe there's a lot of water on the moon, so what? <laughs> now you've got a good question. OK. Well, I mean, because uh, I think one of the things I love about your idea is that it's a small change, but that's something that will have ripple effects back into the system. Because I guess, I mean, so my daughter's, uh, she's 16, she just started sixth form, and so obviously just went through the GCSE system. She was at a grammar school over uh, on the Wirral, and, you know, from what I could tell, I mean, a lot of education is effectively designed so that they do well on these tests, right? As opposed oh, to, you know, especially if it's a relatively high-end school, they're, they're even more sensitized to making sure ultimately test results are really high. So by, by changing the test, you then effectively have a kind of, obviously, a, a, an effect that it, it changes the rest of the system because there's no point in optimizing yeah. for an old test. Yeah, right. yeah that, that's absolutely right. So at the moment, there's an excessive amount of effort by teachers to make students perform yeah. in the GCSE. There are even countries where I've heard of reports where students who might do badly in the final school exams are, are told not to take the exam, right. <laughs> because yeah. it will reduce the school's overall performance. Okay? So it, it is mindless. Uh, it was necessary, though. Yeah. I mean, easy to criticize the old system. It was necessary. Sure. It was yes. necessary. It was necessary, yeah. Yeah, it was necessary in the military industrial world, mm. where you needed people who were identical to each other. Okay? You needed that for factories, for the military, and so on. Everybody must know the same things. Everybody must get the average score. Everybody must even wear the same clothes. <laughs> it's called an uniform. It's even called uniform. Mm. You must be uniform. But we don't need to be uniform anymore. Mm. Okay? We have to be diverse. Mm. So the system has to change. One last question before I let you go. Um, with obviously, generally speaking, in the past, we've talked mostly about school in the cloud, stuff around school. Where, I mean, especially, uh, I would have thought during a time of COVID that, that 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 concept would, that would only be an accelerant for adoption of that concept. I'm just wondering, is there a place in the world where you're seeing adoption of those principles, you know, most aggressively? Um, yes, there are several countries. Actually, in all countries, people have grudgingly said that while schooling didn't happen during the pandemic lockdowns, learning did not stop. Mm. Okay? And they say, well, that wasn't good enough, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it didn't stop. Mm. A different kind of learning was actually happening. And people, when, they, when, they, when the pandemic goes down, uh, I think will retain those bits. Okay. Zoom is not going to go away. Okay? It's very hard for me to imagine that Zoom will go away because yeah. you know, it was so useful. Yeah, it is so yeah, useful. So, so like that, there will be leftovers of the pandemic that will change or, or infiltrate into the system. But what I hope the most is it will change the emphasis or the value that we put on the word knowing. Not knowledge, okay? Don't get me wrong. A lot of people say, Sugata said, knowledge is obsolete. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm saying knowing is not as important as it used to be. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you, sir. Right. Sigala. I think the uh, secretary. I think the uh, secretary. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah.